Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, first and foremost, guys, I don't think I'm going to fill the 12 minutes and I'm not going to be half as eloquent as all the speakers we've had today, as even though like I, I'm a TV presenter, I find this very awkward. But anyway, thank you for having me. Um, I want to start with some data. So as of last year, black British women are four times more likely to die in childbirth than their white Asian mixed race than anyone else. So just hold that in your head for a second. For some reason, black women in the UK right now are four times more likely to go into hospital to give birth and not come out alive. And their children, their babies are 50% more likely to die in the first 28 days. Those are the stats. I didn't know that because I was quite, um, oh, I don't really wanna know her to motherhood. I was not interested whatsoever. Um, motherhood in the black community um, felt quite burdensome. It didn't seem like a joyous thing. It was positioned and is still sold as something that, you know, you just have to do and get on with. And I had a very big hand in helping raise my younger siblings. So I felt like I did that. And I was so sure of that, that I even didn't have a baby. So I had an abortion in my early twenties. And then a few years later, I met this really cool guy and I decided to have a baby and none of that data was available to me then. And the time's come for me to have my kid and a bit like she is now, she was overdue. She always needs to be kicked out of bed. And the induction process began and it was then that it became very apparent to me that this process that is meant to be because all the books I'd read up until then were like motherhood and birthing is this universal thing like you're going to hear all these bloody angels singing it's it's all of this it's all of that that just didn't seem to be available to me I was often asked why I was making so much noise I did notice how um white women who were laboring were treated in a much softer kinder manner I constantly had to wait for pain medication um and then when my waters were finally broken, they waited until my other half said he needed to go home and have a shower. And then they whisked me off to have my waters broken by myself. I was left to labor for 19 hours with no food, just strapped to a bed and quite literally had to beg for a C-section. I would like to say that that's the end of that story, but about three days after giving birth, I start to feel really, really sick. And I've got three different midwives, all of varying races. And I keep telling them, you know, I'm just not feeling well. I'm feeling dizzy. I'm sweating through to the mattress. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm meant to be feeling better, not worse. And they all told me in one way or another that it was in my head that I was overthinking it and that I should perhaps spend less time on mum's net or whatever the forum of the time was. Luckily for me, I was so exhausted one night and my partner was so exhausted, we ended up arguing and I took the baby and I fell asleep with her on my chest. What woke me up was not her crying, it was this smell that we now compare to like a dying pig. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I know they say a, a child's poo stinks, but this is really taking it too far. And as I wake up, as I'm going down the stairs to give, to make her a bottle, because formula fed and proud, no shame in my game, something clicks i feel a rush of liquid start to rush down my legs and i hear my partner shout and it's in that moment i'm like oh it's it's me that smells like the rotting pig cut a long story short i had an infected my wound my c-section wound had become infected and it had turned into sepsis and i was slipping into septic shock i was rushed back to hospital um emergency surgery happened immediately and i spent five weeks away from my kid and you know, this was all in my head, don't forget. I was spending too much time on mum's net. I, you know, was overthinking it. And again, like I said, I, I didn't find out this data, the Embrace report that said that black women were five times more likely to die in childbirth didn't come out until 2018. Um, but now I have that knowledge and that understanding trying to spread that message and let people understand that and as some of our speakers have 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 shown us tonight that you know motherhood really isn't equal when we talk about the intersection of motherhood and race it's not it's not only interesting it's life-threatening 
So imagine being a black mother who is queer or a black mother in the panic years or a black, that intersection can literally be the difference between life and death. And I don't think it gets discussed much. When my child was two, when my eldest was two, I noticed a severe gap in the parenting space online, you know, all of these blogs and all of these people telling me what milk to buy and what push chair to get hold of and what t-shirt I should put my kid in. None of them looked like me. Not only did they not look like me, they didn't talk like me. They didn't come from where I was from. We were clearly from different classes. And it seemed to me that motherhood and parenting was very white, very striped t-shirt, very shiny bob, very middle class. And I was like, so, and I won't lie, at that point, I was only ever looking for myself. I think um, considering how correctly woke the world has become, especially in the last 12 months, I think some of us would like to sit here and think, oh, you know, I look out for others. I will not be yes you. I just looked at the parenting field and I was like, I do not see myself. And I'm really determined to change that. So I began to blog and I began to build an audience around being in this black nuclear family, which we don't get to see often, because what I found is that black British motherhood is usually positioned as like being the baby mother, hence why my book is called I'm Not Your Baby Mother. It's being the single mother who's not feeling too great, who's struggling, who's always shouting at her kids, who doesn't know who the father of her children is. Again, all of that BS. And I was like, that's not the story I know. Granted, my upbringing wasn't the easiest, but it wasn't as horrific as society likes to paint. And I'm definitely living a very different life now. And I would like to see what hand I can have in um, changing that, in changing that stereotype around black British motherhood. And in some cases, creating a framework for it entirely. Because before I decided to share myself and my family online, I didn't see any other black British families feeling as though um, that was a thing, as though you would be listened to, as though there would be an audience willing to see your version of motherhood and parenting. And so I decided to like make that my cause. And now I'm here. Um, and now I am here. It's a bit, I always have to check my newfound privilege because I've changed classes now. I, I've moved out of London. My kids are living a very, very different life to the one that I was living. But I always try to think of the fact that before I even speak or you hear where I'm from or you know or don't know how much money I make, first and foremost, I'm a black woman. And when I step into a room, I'm always gonna be judged by that off the bat. It's never gonna be, oh, you know, she does such and such. No, she's a black woman. Just to like set the tone for you, um, when a policeman murders a black man, he does not care about what his class is or where he lives or where that man's position is in society. They have opened fire because they see black skin as a threat. And I still have to remember that I'm being judged on my skin first and foremost, even in the motherhood sphere, which can be a really bitter pill to swallow. But I also understand how lucky I am. I hate that word, but how lucky I am to now be in a position to rip up the old rule book of what black motherhood has always been positioned as and show people that it can be something entirely different. It's something to be celebrated and respected. And it sure as hell is marketable. Like I don't only need to see one version of one woman selling me a 1000 pound push chair. It is okay to put a woman that looks like me in the position of motherhood that seems to be having a really good time. And so, yeah, I don't know. I've, I had a second kid. So, you know, being at death's door must have been fun because I went back and did it again. Um, uh, they took into account how horrific the first experience was. And I will say that giving birth to my son, who was coincidentally born on my 30th birthday, and it's our birthday on Sunday, so also on Mother's Day, was a very, very different experience. I never like to use words like healing because that would then position my daughter's experience as something that brought me great trauma and I never want to put that on her but my son's experience of birth made me understand that when a black woman is advocated for and listened to and is supported in the birthing space it can make the difference 
literally to the point of life and death. And so I hope that when we have this conversation again, or if I get to have a discussion like this again, that data is eradicated. I hope that government takes this rallying cry to save black women's lives seriously, because there are so many of us going into hospital to give birth and we're ending up in the morgue. And I just don't think people are taking that matter as seriously as they should be. So thanks.